you back here. Can I just take a quick poll? How many of you were at my workshop yesterday? Seeing some raised hands. Wow, a lot of you. Thank you so much for um, turning out here so early. I mean, I know I would not be up this early on a Saturday morning most Saturdays. <laughs> I'd be sleeping in for quite a long time. Uh, time I shall not disclose. But this presentation I'm hoping will make your getting up early and even on such a beautiful day as this worth it. Now, I want to ask a question. What did you want to be when you were little when you grew up? So that was maybe slightly awkward phrasing. But think back to when you were little, and I'm guessing that at least a few of you got one of the things that you wanted to be when you grew up from a book. How many of you think this is true? You got something you wanted to be from a book at some point. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. It makes sense. Stories have always inspired us, I think, um, to be you know, Superman or Cinderella. My slide went move ahead. I had an image that was supposed to go along with that. Uh, that definitely went way ahead. There we go. Now when I was very little, actually not so little, maybe like five, six, seven, I wanted to be a pioneer. You know the type bonnet and braids and hoop skirt dress. Now that image in my head at that young age is actually not from so long ago. That was my Halloween costume. And I wore that to high school. So yeah, you can tell I really like the whole pioneer thing. And I was inspired by Little House on the Prairie. I absolutely love those books. Who here has read Little House on the Prairie? <laughs> yes, some guys have read Little House on the Prairie. This is amazing. <laughs> That's usually not true. Well, I have a very special place in my seven-year-old heart for the Little House on the Prairie books. I had the entire box set, all eight books, and they occupied this very special shrine-like place on my bookshelf. And I read about Laura Ingalls Wilder's adventures and misadventures from Wisconsin to North Dakota and everywhere in between. And along with my perhaps already giant list of aspirations, I wanted to be a pioneer just like Laura. But since that wasn't too likely in the 21st century, and I already live in the Puget Sound, so I'm about as far west as you can go without hitting, I guess, the Olympic Peninsula, I settled for the idea of being a teacher. I found something very romantic about teaching, especially the way that it was portrayed in these little house books. There was something so appealing about this image of standing up in front of a one-room schoolhouse, blackboard behind you, maybe with a ruler, and if a kid did anything to step out of line, you could whack them on the hand. <laughs> <laughs> maybe some of you still fantasize about this. <laughs> Actually, this is starting to sound terrible. But in the last book in the series, Happy Golden Years, maybe some of you have read it if you were really big little house devotees like me. Laura Ingalls Wilder actually goes to teach this rural country school, and she's actually still a teenager herself, younger and smaller than many of her students. And so she has this added challenge of having to prove herself to these bigger kids. She's not quite the wacky on a hand with the ruler type of teacher. Indeed, she tells herself that she won't be, but she does face the challenge of maintaining discipline and gaining these kids' respect. I love the book, and I love the idea of being a teacher like Laura myself. Now, this was a somewhat strange career choice when you think about it at seven years of age, because I feel like, especially now, young people don't tend toward the idea of being a teacher automatically or culturally. In fact, uh, my mom is from China, so I know a little bit of Chinese. This is the Chinese word for teacher, laoshe, and it literally means old master. So to be a young old master is somewhat incongruous. But I got my opportunity to be exactly that a lot sooner than I had expected, because I might have mentioned that along with my huge list of potential careers, I was really into the idea of being a writer, and probably see where I got that from. I love reading and writing so much that when someone told me, I don't like reading in a nonchalant voice. My world of perceptions about reading and writing, I guess up to that point, kind of shattered. My mind just was like, what? You don't like reading? How is this possible? The laws of the universe have been overturned. <laughs> I decided that I would have to change this, that I would simply go around to various elementary schools and make kids like reading and writing. I was really forceful about it. <laughs> As it turns out, it's not just elementary school kids who don't like reading and writing. It's some of you may have found out, and I was soon facing crowds of middle and even high schoolers. So here I was, about this short, okay, maybe that short, <laughs> and I was publishing my first book, Flying Fingers, actually around that age, but I was really going to these schools when I was barely eight years old. 
So I was standing up in front of 10, 12, 14, 16 year old kids. I had to establish my credibility. So I modeled myself after what I knew a teacher was. The person who stood in front of the classroom and knew everything and didn't admit to being wrong or always established that discipline and management. Being a teacher, I thought, meant that I would be teaching all the time, not learning. The student hat was for later. So every time I stood up in front of a group of these students that I was teaching, I was putting on kind of an invisible suit of armor. But I mentioned I also really like medieval history. <laughs> Fortunate in the long run, but unfortunately for my ego, there was a problem. I couldn't pretend to know everything uh, because I didn't know everything. So my suit of armor was starting to show cracks. As an example, my subject of expertise was language arts. I would go to these schools and talk to students, try to motivate them, we would write together, we would come up with ideas, discuss writing techniques. Mostly I spoke from a motivational standpoint, but increasingly I would start to instruct students on specific types of writing. I would go into similes and metaphors and all the different um, types of figurative language, how to weave a personal or fictional narrative. I know our keynote last night was not so enthused about personal narrative, which I can definitely understand. And then when I was 10 years old, I was using video conferencing to connect to these schools around the nation. And one day, I get a request to connect with a school of fifth graders in New York, and I think, okay, this should be fun. So I can present about descriptive writing techniques, maybe I'll start with some figurative language, similes and metaphors, and we'll explore what the concept of show not tell is, and if they're precocious, we can talk about onomatopoeia, because that's really fun to say. <laughs> now little did I know, I know, little did I know, I should never ever use that phrase, but still, little did I know quite how precocious they were. Since they seem to know a lot, I started asking them more questions, trying to gauge how much further their knowledge went. And students began raising their hands to give examples of similes and metaphors that I had never imagined, which freaked me out a little bit. But that wasn't all. Someone mentioned onomatopoeia, and I started typing up these things in a Word document, making this list, as anyone who was at my workshop yesterday saw me do that in a somewhat similar style. So far, so good. And then one kid, he raises his hand and says, what about hyperbole? 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 So I was 10, my mind starts going into overdrive, and I'm trying to think, what is hyperbole? Where have I heard that word before? Have I heard that word before? So I'm standing there a little bit confused, and the kids are waiting for me to say something. I stare blankly for a moment, and then I say, hyperbole, right. Um, how do you spell that? Now, have any of you ever run into an acquaintance whose name you know you should know, but you've forgotten? <laughs> some of you have? OK, well, a technique that maybe some of you have used is, how do you spell your name? Like, if you're writing it or something. Of course, you don't actually know their name. You just give them a spelling. So if you've ever done that, maybe I'm the only one and I feel really evil right now. But if you've ever done that, you know that I was bluffing when I asked that kid to spell hyperbole. I was trying to figure out what it meant. The spelling of it, which he obligingly provided, wasn't going to help either, because I looked at this and I was like, okay, it's spelled like hyperbole, and I can't deduce any of the roots or what's going on with this word. So all I said was hyperbole, very good, and then I moved on. I'm assuming that most of you here know what hyperbole is, but when I found out that hyperbole was basically a fancy word for overstatement, or I guess exaggeration, directly after that video conference, when I ran upstairs and looked it up, I gnashed my teeth that I hadn't known it. I could rattle off simile, metaphor, apostrophe, onomatopoeia, but darn you hyperbole. <laughs> and I told this frustrating, humiliating story to my mom. Now, I assure you, I am not using hyperbole when I say that I was in the throes of 10-year-old despair. <laughs> but my mom, my lovely mother, who's just sitting in the audience over there, my dad, awesome, talking to <laughs> um, she just tells me, oh, look at it as a learning experience. Now, I'm 10, I'm starting to enter that phase where I don't really listen to what my mom says. Furthermore, she says that everything is a learning experience. Oh, you nearly got run over by a bus while jaywalking across a busy New York City street? Learning experience. <laughs> story, by the way. But basically, I didn't take her very seriously. Fast forward about two years, and because this is going, I'm doing another video conference. 
And I'm asking students for examples of adjectives to describe this main character that we're creating. This lovely, wonderful main character whose maybe weakness is being selfish. And what are her strengths or his strengths? So I'm typing up these words and somebody says, well, maybe this character is really beautiful. So easy, right? I start typing this up and I open up, so I'm opening up my Word document, making this list of words and beautiful is a pretty easy word to spell, right? So I'm like, be, wait, no, that's not right. Be like that. And the kids are looking at this because I have it in this really big font and I'm starting to laugh. <laughs> because here's a Doris who's written a book and she can't spell beautiful. That's not very beautiful. <laughs> I shouted at myself mentally so much and I was starting to get this terribly huge grimace on my face, I guess. It was not a smile at all. It might have been okay, some of you saw my spelling yesterday actually, but I actually pride myself on being a rather good speller most of the time. I can spell deoxyribonucleic acid, D-O-X-Y-R-O, no I can't, never mind. <laughs> Usually I can. But, <laughs> don't take my word for it. Add to that the fact that I was the writing content provider, and I thought, well, writers have to be good at spelling. So you have this terrible scene set up for humiliation. Finally, I let that grimace turn into a laugh because, quite honestly, not being able to spell beautiful properly is pretty funny. And I just asked them to help me out and spell it for me. So these kids, they all clamor and they shout B E E A U T I F U L, although it was not that easy because they all said the different word letters at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Worked with elementary school students, know they're rather apt to do. And we move on. But those two stories really highlight, I think, to me, how I was starting to see that that suit of armor I was setting up was kind of showing cracks. That maybe wearing a stiff, invisible suit of armor made me a little too inflexible about being able to learn from my students, who were, after all, the same age as I was. But it's not just about learning from your peers. I've also heard stories about teachers who can be sometimes reluctant to learn from their students or to maybe accept that they could do things better sometimes if a student tells them. Now, and whether it stems from the idea that teachers need to be authoritative or superior, or the idea that they're younger, they can't teach me anything, I feel like this is a bit misguided. If you take technology as a case in point, there are many amazing teachers who are striving to use technology in their classrooms, and then there are also teachers who won't let students touch technology tools. I was at a conference in Boston one time and a teacher told me that some of his colleagues had actually set up these blue tape areas where they laid down tape around the smart board and they laid down tape around the computers and they said, you will not cross this blue tape line during class ever. And I just thought, wow, you know, what could be going on that is being limited right there? Suits of armors can come in all kinds of shapes and forms. Sometimes they're when you move on instead of asking kids what hyperbole means, sometimes it's blue tape around technology. Now, when that kid from New York raised his hand and stumped me with hyperbole, I suppose that I probably should have stopped, asked him more, asked him to teach the class for a bit. What is this? Tell us about this thing that you know that I really don't honestly know that much about. But instead, I moved on. Now, I guess, and this makes me feel a little bit better, I could have done a bit worse. Imagine if I told him to shut his mouth to, start, to stop being such a smart elect and that we hadn't reached that concept yet, so keep quiet. Now, I don't think any teacher would actually say that. But in essence, that is what we hear every day with, please don't read ahead in the text, you'll get out of sequence, or read the books on this shelf. That shelf is for sixth graders, it's too hard for you. Or teachers who aren't open to learning from students. One of my favorite teachers was exactly the opposite. So to give you a bit of background, my mom ran a small homeschooling program for many years, and it was for me, my sister, some of our classmates from the neighborhood, and Felisa was one of our teachers. So we're going to head back to the Prezi now. And she loved Mexican revolutionary history and Alexander Hamilton above all else, well, with the possible exception of coming up with nasty epithets for President Bush in Spanish, which <laughs> was actually a really effective way to learn Spanish. And she was very close to us. Now, sorry, I should not have brought in politics at all, but that was like really one of the hallmarks of my childhood. <laughs> Anyhow, um, she was 
it's pretty awesome because we didn't have a sixth curriculum, so she really brought in what she was passionate about, what she knew a lot about. So we learned about Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa and all these other Mexican revolutionary figures, which was pretty awesome because, you know, seven-year-olds, other seven-year-olds were generally filling out worksheets about, okay, here's your spelling for today and such. So we got to learn about poetry and Alexander Hamilton and art history and anatomy. But while Felisa was an expert on many things, she also admitted where her weaknesses were quite readily. We sometimes helped her with spelling, for instance. Actually, we helped her with spelling quite a lot. And that didn't make us suddenly think that she was a bad teacher or that we could let chaos reign in the classroom. There was one time where we overthrew her as she was the dictator of Zanayanoff, but that is an entirely another story as part of an imaginary country. But this equality, I think, made us feel like we were integral parts of our classroom success. That we were as invested in our learning as she was. That it wasn't just about, oh, you know, she has this stuff to teach us, and she has to teach it to us, and we really should try everything in our power to make sure we don't learn it. There's sometimes that adversarial relationship students have to learning. We definitely didn't have that. We felt like we were key pieces in the jigsaw instead. But a really good example of how Felisa made herself human came from another weakness, mine, in math. I was really bad at math when I was little. I would say that I still am, except that I discovered euphemisms. My math needs improvement. <laughs> <laughs> and I would actually get so stressed out about the idea of doing mental math, I'm hoping some of you maybe can relate to this, that I would burst into tears and be so overcome my emotions, so I would have to leave the room. I was a very dramatic child. <laughs> now one day, I did exactly that. I burst into tears. I was so nervous. I didn't like the idea of having to do this in front of my classmates who are all older than me and smarter than me. So instead of ordering me out to get out and dry my tears, stop causing a scene, and get back to math, I guess she could have done that. But Felisa told me instead that when she was young, she had been put in the gifted program. And while that was fine for reading and writing, she was not exactly gifted in math. And that she, like me, had a lot of difficulty keeping up. That suddenly made her empathetic to me. Because here was someone who might not have been the best teacher evaluated purely on knowledge of math, but the fact that I felt she knew what I was going through made a big difference. Furthermore, Felisa wrote with us all the time. She didn't just give us assignments and sit back and wait for us to finish and collect them. Instead, she wrote with us and shared her writing. Sometimes we even critiqued it, said you could make this more interesting, or, you know, who really speaks like that? The divide between teacher and student had actually been replaced by the, by the equality of being fellow writers. Looking back on these stories, I realized that we may underestimate the value of one very good thing, of one very big thing when it comes to what we think about when we hear a very good teacher. We know that passion for a subject and knowledge about it, caring about students, and on your feet thinking are all necessary traits for teachers. But we rarely bring up the importance of being human. As students, we're used to teachers as these omnipotent, make no mistake, authority figures. And as teachers, we often feel pressured to maintain that facade. But our favorite main characters usually, who are our favorite main characters? They're not the goody two-shoes with the perfect lives who always get straight A's and never do anything wrong. They're Harry Potter, whose bravery sometimes, okay, almost always errs on the side of being stupid. Or Laurie Owens Wilder, who can't help but to be vengeful at that nasty mean girl Nellie Olson sometimes. They're the fictional characters who are every bit as flawed as we are. And our favorite leaders are the ones who don't always protect themselves and stay in the palace while the fighting is going on. If any of you have seen this famous picture of Alexander the Great, and I'm sure he was behind being portrayed this way, but he's out there and he's leading the charge and not letting other people do it for them. We love Winston Churchill, who stayed in London and visited the bombed out buildings in the worst days of the Blitz. So why should our favorite teachers be any different? Now I'm still working on exploring how I can be a better learner, as well as a teacher. And one way I can try to put myself on the front lines when I teach is through collaborative writing with students. So a lot of you who are in the workshop saw me do this. We worked on a treehouse. We wrote a dramatic bit of a personal narrative. And I love doing collaborative writing, and this is why. I feel like there's often a big gap between point A, where the concept is introduced, whether it's a technique for descriptive writing, or essay, or whatever it is, and point B, where it's, okay, here's your assignment, go home and do this, or do this in class. Students often feel, well, you know, where's the example? I want to see this. 
how do I get from point A to point B? So the student's going to look at their friends, roll their eyes, maybe sigh a little, go home. We'll get on the Facebook group for that class and say, how do you write this? Can you post an example? Because everyone is waiting for someone else to do it first. It can overall seem like a pretty daunting task. So with my collaborative writing exercises, I try to take that away, to work with students, to produce that equality as writers, and to have a live demonstration to show the writing process and that I, as a writer and a teacher, I'm not perfect, I make mistakes, I can't spell beautiful sometimes, and I definitely edit along the way. Now the essential feeling of vulnerability that I mentioned yesterday, that I get when I'm writing, I feel is absolutely essential for my teaching practice because I've very rarely felt scared while writing and this allows me to put myself in less confident writer's shoes. Yet I feel like a lot of the mechanisms with which we see writing taught, especially at, well, really at any level, I suppose, in a lot of schools, they're put in place to prevent that feeling of vulnerability, whether on the part of the student or the part of the teacher. I've had the opportunity to lead these video conferencing sessions, and a lot of times I'll speak with students, and, and their experience with writing has been within the confines of spidery-looking mind maps and strict outlines, forms, fill-in-the-blank worksheets. It's very difficult to go wrong there when you're filling in the blank. But going wrong is part of writing just as it is part of life. In my experience teaching poetry as well, I've encountered a lot of students whose only exposure to writing poetry has been through forms. They've learned, here's a haiku, and here's how many syllables are in this line, and this line, and this line, and villanelles, and sonnets. And I have absolutely nothing wrong with haikus, and sonnets, and villanelles. They're wonderful to write, but we're not doing students any favors if they're only able to memorize forms, and they're not able to come up with ideas. My friend Regan Asin gave a speech at the conference I organized, TEDx Redmond, in 2010, and she touched on this phenomenon in some language arts classes that she had taken. She's a prolific poet herself. Her sister is actually a published poet, and is really awesome. Um, she writes poetry quite a bit. But what had happened in her language arts class was they had this assignment for a poem about winter. But instead of coming up with a poem about winter, or coming up with a list of words to try a poem about winter, they were given three-fourths of the poem. All they had to do was fill in the endings of each line. Now, when in life have you ever been handed a fill-in-the-blank dilemma? or a multiple choice crisis. <laughs> Has emphasizing creativity above what sounds good or looks like poetry led to some arguably spectacularly terrible poems? It sure has. If anyone, was in my, anyone who's in my workshop yesterday knows the story of um, writing a poem about a ninja with bladder control problems attacking a dragon, it's elementary school students, best one in my life. But the point is that we all shared this feeling of being nervous, vulnerable writers. We thought, you know, is this too stupid of an idea? And we were in laughter uh, almost all the time. But we really saw that poetry is what you make of it. I felt like that was incredible for our ownership of the craft. Because suddenly these students saw, I can write about what matters to me. And that, and I can write about characters who I feel I can relate to. And that could be a ninja who pees in his pants when he's scared. <laughs> Even so, and especially with poetry, students often wonder, why am I doing this? You know, why do I need to learn how to write this form of writing that, you know, I've never seen in a business letter, or I've never seen, you know, Bill Gates write poetry? Well, you can always tell them that President Obama wrote poetry, which is pretty cool. But many of you know about the importance I place on having an authentic writing experience for true motivation a lot of the time. And that means readership larger than the teacher or one classroom. It means sending writing into literary journals, creating an anthology, having a class blog where students can write and have editors from the entire world. When students have the opportunity to see their writing having a real impact, the question of why is answered. Students sometimes ask me, why do you bother writing? And I think, first of all, okay, I've failed if you think that it's a bother. But the second thing is, I bother writing because I can make someone cry or laugh when they hear a poem. And I can convince a teacher to stop giving homework with a really well-researched persuasive essay. Real writers have the chance to feel that motivation to see their impact every single day, or at least a lot of the time. When I wrote a blog post for the Huffington Post one time called, Would You Let Your Daughter Wear This? You should look it up, it's a cool article. Um, I got like over 2,000 comments, some of them were critical, a lot of them were supportive, and I saw in these comments how what I had written about had touched a chord, or how it had made people angry, 
And I think that that showed me, really, this is why I write. But most students never have the chance to write a post for the Huffington Post and get thousands of comments. So how can you bring opportunities like that to your students? Well, actually, they have a teen section now, so any of you who teach high school should encourage your students to do that. But if we wish to build true communities of writers and communities of editors in our language arts classrooms, we have to give students the opportunities that allow them to be real writers, too. Perfect examples come from some people that I know. Liam DeLeo in Dubai, Nikhil Goyal in New York, and Eva Reidenhauer, I believe she's in uh, North Dakota. Now, Liam writes for her blog on her website, it's appropriately titled Writing is Fun, about her life and conferences she's attended. And she recently wrote a really interesting article on education, provocatively titled How Schools Are Killing Creativity, for the Huffington Post, which I encourage you to look up. Nikhil is an education reform advocate, and he's written a several hundred page book called All Hands on Deck, Why America Needs a Learning Revolution. He's a junior in high school, by the way. The research that he did for this book was incredible and extensive. He interviewed hundreds of educators and entrepreneurs over several years, phone calls, Skype, he went to offices, knocked on doors, basically did everything in his power to get interviews with some really prominent people, and I highly recommend it to everyone. Eva participated in National Model Writing Month. She visits schools to teach fellow students about writing, and she makes YouTube videos that give me a run for my money. I also um, make YouTube videos about writing, which I will show you. Um, if you actually, and now that YouTube has its education filter, I'm hoping that a lot of you can maybe get to YouTube in schools. So this is my channel where I post my um, poetry reading, where I post my teaching videos for language arts and interviews and such. Um, so yeah, I highly encourage you to check that out. So this is one of Eva's. And keep in mind that this is an eight-year-old girl who just decided, you know what, I can teach other students about writing. So now that we have our sitting in characters, let's talk about plot. plot. The plot is what happens in the story. OK, pretend that you are writing a roller coaster. You look at it and see that it starts out like a flat line. Then it goes up to the very top and goes speeding down to the end. That's how plot works. The plot lines the beginning, where you meet the characters and establish the setting. You want the readers to care about your characters, so spend a little time talking about them. The climb upwards on the roller coaster is called rising action. Here it gets exciting. Things start happening to your character. It gets more fun. Maybe things even get scary. Now, you're at the very top of the roller coaster. This is called the climax. It is the most exciting part of your story. Everything gets crazy here. And then, boom, the action stops. The characters solve the problem, or maybe they don't, but things settle down. This brings us to the part of the roller coaster that glides down and out to the end. This is called falling action, and it is the part of the story that wraps things up after the big excitement and takes you to the end of the story. If you have time, try this. Draw your roller coaster, book, birds on the run, or any story you like. First draw a simple roller coaster map, like the one I showed you. Then write down the parts of the story that will fit on your roller coaster map. So this is a great example, and Eva has a webcam and a microphone and screen sharing, and this is an eight-year-old girl. Now, I find this really awesome because when I was eight years old, I hadn't really started yet making videos like this. I was starting to go to schools. And I think it's amazing because now I wonder what Eva will be doing when she's 14. So thinking about kids like Eva, Lean, and Nikhil, I think, well, in each of these examples, they didn't have to be told what to do. They didn't have to be assigned things to write, and no teacher gave them a grade. Yet their projects are filled with learning and valuable development of writing skills. I would say make many ordinary writing students pale in comparison. I mean, a several hundred page book or a video about plot, you know, these are pretty awesome things. Now, why? I feel that Eva, Lee, and Nikhil have a purpose. They know that there are readers out there and they know that what they do will help someone or will raise awareness around an issue. Moreover, students often hear about the importance of writing what you know. Have you ever told students to write about what you know? Anyone here? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Yet it can be difficult to, for students to see their own lives as valuable or interesting enough to write about. I, for one, know that even though I've traveled to so many places, I will sometimes get a prompt, like write about a time you were brave or something like that, and I'll think, what? 
do, was I ever really in my life, like can I think of a time? And of course, you know, you come up with something and you, you know, throw in some examples that are maybe a little bit sketchy as to whether they actually happened to you, etc. <laughs> you do the whole puppies and kittens thing, if I can quote Dr. Sarah for me. Actually, I took the high school proficiency exam since I'm in Washington, it's our high school thing. The prompt, which the teacher proctored the exam agreed insulted our intelligence, was write about your favorite season. Why is it your favorite season? Mm -hmm. I just went, we're high school students, please save us from this. The worst part was that we had to stay there for three hours, and you know, I'm taking AP classes, we write essays in 30 minutes, so I was, you know, done with this thing in 15 and sitting there for two and a half. That, I feel, is the problem with some of the way that writing is taught, because when you get a prompt like that, I feel like we don't need to spend an entire year learning how to respond to it. But that is a bit of a tangent um, for writing what you know. Even though I've faced a lot of obstacles, conflicts in my life, I get terribly nervous before I stand up here on a stage like this in front of lovely, not scary people like you. Okay, you're actually all terrifying. <laughs> I find that difficult sometimes to write about. I wonder, well, other people have stood on stages before, it just doesn't seem that interesting. Now, imagine what kids who have never given a speech, have never traveled outside the country, or maybe never traveled outside the state will do when they get an example or a prompt that they just feel that they can't relate to or pull something from their life about. So when I ask the students, what are some conflicts you face in your life? One kid is going to say, I got in an argument with my brother. And then suddenly from that point onward, it is a litany of getting into arguments with your brother. I fought with him about a video game. I fought with him about a pop school that I went in. I mean, like, what is it with little brothers? Moreover, what is it with students feeling that they don't have anything in their lives to write about, or that they have to copy what everyone else is doing in order to be right? Now, in that instance, I ask them to consider mundane events to be really magical and dramatize them, but there's also, I feel, more that we can do. When, there's, when there are students who really want new, exotic settings to write about, who want to go to worlds maybe beyond their own local setting, the power of the internet can really come in handy. As a writer, I think about using Google Earth to bring students to the peaks of the Andes or the streets of St. Petersburg so they could practice wielding their descriptive and observational power, skills useful for, I think, almost any kind of writing. Or using the Google Art Project to bring them to the great paintings and sculptures of the world and ask them, imagine that you're Nike of Samothrace or something, and, or another famous sculpture or painting, and how would you write about it? Or how could you use the images and really tell stories with images and describe that out loud? You, know, you could do the multimodal storytelling. While teaching students to turn the mundane into the intriguing through their writing is an essential and wonderful skill, I feel that giving students a global perspective, really bringing them on virtual trips anywhere, can also show them inspiration can come from anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be the world that you see around you. You can write about what you don't know sometimes. Now, embracing vulnerability by being students ourselves Creating authenticity for students as writers with readership that goes beyond one teacher or one class. Expanding students' horizons and ability to imagine, describe, and write by using experiences in the virtual world. These are all actions that I hope that we can take to hopefully ensure that the students who walk in language arts classrooms will never walk out saying, I hate writing or I hate reading. I'm sure that you have already ensured that in many of your classes. So I would love to, for you to take a few minutes, discuss with your neighbor what are actions you've taken to motivate students to be better readers and writers. And it doesn't have to be technology, it could really be literally anything, a project, an assignment, a group, um, you know, a really fun day in class, anything. Go ahead and take it. The conference that invites dinner, and I kind of lifted up my mom's iPhone. This is actually a Kindle, so it doesn't make pictures. But I lifted up my mom's iPhone and kind of like barely above the tablecloth, pretending to be texting or something. I took a really surreptitious camera phone picture of her. <laughs> <laughs> But more to the point, what are some <laughs> other <laughs> wonderful writing activities that you've used to motivate your students? Or that your neighbors have used? Yes. I've done an awful lot of um, 
but I'm going to call Realia and bringing tons of things in to help kids bring to life some wish, dream, far place, any of those kinds of things. And I've also taken international pen pals and let kids write in to my class where they observe what's going on. We were invited to Bermuda. And um, also had students from Russia writing on graph paper in perfect order. So I never had to speak to my kids about how our letters look. They would just look at that and go, okay, they'll have to be able to read it. And so many ideas flowed from that and a lot of discussion over what we were doing and where writing goes. Wonderful. That discussion about where writing goes I think is super important. Learning from the Russians is always an amazing thing as well. We can definitely take a lot from international um, pen pals from discussing wishes, dreams. I think that's a really amazing idea. Thank you for sharing. Great. Someone's heard sound. <laughs> My sister's goes boing, and they did this in the middle of an orchestra concert. So, <laughs> yes. Um, if you go to the Scholastic website, they have a program called Story Spinners, and it is great. It gives you a silly, light character, and you can spin until you find whatever subject, or situation. You do a postcard, a letter, and use paper. Um, story Spinners. When I was That's awesome. Story spinners. Great. Okay. Yeah, so I remember when I was in like fourth grade or so, well, like younger, then I would be taking the, the wassail, like that's now it's going to place made on a speed, but the Washington State, um, I don't know what that stands for, I've seen it on I would, um, since there was tons of extra time, it was being a state test and a lot of time people allotted, I would actually go to the computer and I would start writing stories. And I remember that the girl sitting next to me, who was also on the computer, I think she had gone on the internet or something a long time ago, and she said, you're writing a story? Wow, you're just like doing that for fun? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I do it for fun, because writing is what I do for fun. I guess I could have gone on and said it was my identity or something, but I was in fourth grade, so I didn't speak like that. But the point is, is that I think when we have students to a point where they will write, and write and write and write. And like when I was six years old, my mom actually had to yell for me to come to dinner to you know, stop writing already. And I think that when we can, maybe not necessarily getting students to value writing or food, but getting <laughs> students to that point of really just wanting to write all the time if they can, that, that's amazing. Now I was rereading these Happy Golden Years, the last book in the Little House series a little while back, and I caught a gem of a line of dialogue. It's a really short part, but it made me realize that maybe Laura Ingalls Wilder and I, though we're separated by more than a century, weren't so different after all. She might have been up in front of a one-room class, one-room uh, schoolhouse up in front of a blackboard, and I was in front of a video conferencing camera. But we both started out trying to prove ourselves to an older crowd, to show our classroom management skills and our know-how. And eventually, she discovered, a bit sooner than I, that collaboration, Reciprocal learning and putting yourself at the same level as your students, not all omnipotent superiority is the way to go. So in this very short passage, a student in Laura's class named Martha is facing a lot of difficulty with grammar, diagramming sentences and the like. So Laura says, I would like to go over it again myself because she's trying to keep up with her new class in town. And here she has, she says, grammar is hard. If you'd like to, we can go through this lesson together. And they do, and Martha gets it. Now this is a tiny passage, and you might say, well, that's not really showing anything. But I was very hopeful and maybe a little idealistic, and I thought, yes, it does, similar goals and admitting a weakness and a spirit of collaboration and maybe a certain amount of equality. This is not that you didn't get your grammar right, so go and write five lines on the blackboard as punishment type teacher that I thought Laura Ingalls Wilder maybe was or that I was sort of emulating in a weird way. This is the teacher as learning partner. So maybe there are some big ideas to be found in Little House. As we go into our daily lives and enter writing classrooms, I hope to maybe visit a few of yours, see your students who I know about are wonderful, and you are guiding students along this journey of dreaming and writing and creating. Maybe we should worry less about, do I look good? Am I authoritative? Am I managing the students as much as I should? Will I be a failure? And more about, am I making it clear that I'm relatable, that I'm human, with vulnerabilities like everyone else? Am I a writer, like I'm encouraging my students to be writers? And most importantly, am I learning? 
because learning from your students is in no way a weakness. As an eight-year-old, I thought that all teachers did was teach, not learn. Little did I know that in what took many beautifuls and hyperboles and fleeces and rereading of Little House on the Prairie to teach me. As the pioneering librarian John Cotton Dana said, who dares to teach must never cease to learn. Thank you. So something where those intersect ethically would be nice. <laughs> Heading the U.S. Department of Education. That would be nice. The U.S. Yeah. Department of Education. If any of you are in touch with future presidents who would be willing to promise to appoint me, <laughs> that's that's why I feel like it's not such a steady career aspiration. <laughs> Uh, in your presentation, you're referring to the use of uh, sentence framing as um, not favoring creativity. Mm -hmm. How do you conciliate this with second language learners mm -hmm. who do not have internalized uh, some uh, structure that would allow them to be creative in second language? That's a really good question from the perspective of um, like ESL students, how I see sentence frames for creativity. I would say, um, I don't myself have experience with, I, well, I have experience with learning French and Chinese, but I would say that um, I, hmm, I haven't actually worked directly with that many ESL students, so I would say that if possible, if students can come up with ideas first, I guess, I think that that's more my idea, because what I feel like sentence frames do is they take away, they, they bring the point of the sentence in, in the student's you know, fill the words, and I feel like coming up with the point of the sentence first is kind of important to being able to just, you know, create like that. Um, otherwise, I feel like students feel that ownership over the writing is somewhat taken away. So even if the sentences are grammatically incorrect or very simple, I feel like it would still be most of the time preferable. Um, that's just what I can say. Like when I'm learning French and stuff, I definitely try to write a lot of my own stuff, even though, you know, I know some of it might be pretty incorrect. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I would just say um, thank you so much for coming out this early. I really appreciate your questions. You've taught me a lot. Made me think about some really important issues. Um, thanks for bringing that up. By the way. Uh, and I think that overall, there is well, actually, there's like tons of messages. That I guess I have during my speech. But if there's one that I think that you can take to your students, it's that really authentic readership and that being a real writer are things that are really important, but being a real writer um, can be as simple as just setting pen to paper or fingers to a keyboard and taking the time to write. It doesn't mean, you know, having 30,000 books published or being in famous magazines or anything like that, because creating that community of writers is really what it's all about. And I would like to thank all the amazing teachers and my parents for giving me the chance to do that, and I really look forward to seeing your students become writers, uh, uh, or I'm sure they all already are. Thank you so much. A little bit short for the podium, so just tell me if you if I disappear from view or something, <laughs> which I hopefully should do. Today's talk, or I should more accurately say workshop, because I'm really looking forward to hearing a lot from you and really participating back and forth quite a bit. Um, the title is called The 21st Century Writer's Toolbox. And I think that this really represents my attitude toward writing when I think about it. Um, really, as a teacher, is that I'm a writer myself, and so I try to come at it from that angle. Now, as a student, I also bring that sort of perspective on writing that I have from um, being a student in an English class. And I think that I've learned a lot of things from this dual experience of both working with students to teach them about writing and being a learner myself. So, you've heard a bit about me. I'd love to hear more about you. Um, can you raise your hand if you're a principal? Any principals in the room? Okay, great. Raise your hand if you're a teacher. Great, lots of teachers. And elementary? Wow, okay, middle? A few people, and high school? Wow, okay. So, I can definitely see um, high school, middle schools will outnumber here <laughs> by elementary. Um, which is an awesome thing. I would personally really love working with elementary school students because they're the only ones who, when I'm asking for ideas, everyone is raising their hands and just clamoring to be heard, which I think is a lovely trait. And then for some reason that just goes away as you get older. So hopefully some of the things that we'll talk about here can encourage participation and really motivate students to take part more. 
Now, one thing that I'd love to hear from you before I um, get started with some of these techniques and such, what are some of the challenges you faced or some success stories you've had, actions you've taken, what I'd like to share? I can see the hand raising really does go down. <laughs> some brave souls. Yes, I think one challenge is having students get started on their writing. It's like that brain block that they just can't get started. Having students get started on the writing, overcoming the brain block at the beginning, great. And does anyone have a solution that they've used to address that? Talk. Talking, great. So the importance of talking, maybe before getting started with a story or telling students, okay, now it's your job to go do this, maybe discussing it, really having that interaction. And I think that's something very important for me when I am teaching students is that I really try to put myself in their shoes, quite literally. I do a lot of collaborative writing and writing with the students, but I also imagine, okay, I have this assignment, or I have this project, and I'm about to get started on. How would I feel? What would I write about? And if I feel stuck myself thinking about that, I realize, okay, there's a bit of a problem, and I need to work with them. So, I'm going to make this full screen over here. <coughs> One thing that I really love doing is something called being a poison tester, or I should say the poison tester effect. I made it this name because a lot of times I'll see the students, if they hear, okay, we're going to write an essay, we'll get super scared, you know, okay, it's an essay, this is going to kill me. Let's just pull an all-nighter. There's this very, like, adversarial relationship with essays, or even sometimes with fictional narratives. It's something that you've gotten over. And I think that when teachers really work with students to write in front of them and show, hey, I'm doing this, I'm vulnerable too, it can be incredibly powerful by showing that you as a teacher are actually a writer as well and can be as weak, can be as confused, can be as blocked sometimes as any of them with ideas. So that's incredibly powerful. Um, and showing that also shows you're not scared to undertake the things that you're asking them to do. So that's something that I really love to do. When I'm asking students to get started on writing their ideas for a personal narrative, for instance, we'll actually choose an idea to work on together and experience that maybe we all have in common, and then I'll open up a document and start writing. So to demonstrate, I'd just love to try this with all of you. Um, how about we do a descriptive writing passage, kind of elementary school level perhaps, since that's the majority of people here. So we'll write about a treehouse, an imaginary treehouse. Now, to source ideas for this imaginary treehouse and make sure that we're using good descriptive words, I'd like to ask for your ideas. So what are some adjectives that could describe this treehouse? Just throw out some adjectives. Large. Okay. Enchanted. Enchanted. Rickety. I'm sorry. Rickety. Rickety. Love it. What else? Spider inhabited. Spider inhabited. Great. What else? Open windows. Open windows. Lovely. I'm starting to see the image of this trio I you guys take for. What are some other things? What words are we missing? What about the hmm? Secrets. Great. Hideaway. Hideaway. And what about colors? Any colors that come to mind with this treehouse? Tiny. Yellow. Yellow. Brown. Tiny. Brown. Wooded. Red, wooded. Great, so we have this list of words and adjectives that can describe the treehouse. And now the question is how do we weave this together in something that makes sense and that really gives the reader an interesting description, a very visual image. So we might start with where it is. It's setting. Um, it's wooded. So is it in the middle of like a really big enchanted forest or is it in someone's backyard? Okay, raise your hand for enchanted forest. Seeing some raised hands, raised hands from someone's backyard. Wow, we have some people who like realistic settings here, all right? So, <laughs> a secret garden type of backyard. A secret garden type of backyard. Okay, the backyard is isolated, hidden deep within a nest of uh, crawling tendrils of ivy. Okay, wait, tendrils isn't like the right word for oh. Okay, um, so actually, this is sort of what I mean. Usually, I wouldn't be quite similar to the first sentence, but working with students, I definitely have a lot of thoughts running through my mind. Will they think this is good? Will they think it's boring? Um, will they think, oh, she's not that great of a writer, why is she teaching us? But that vulnerability <laughs> is incredibly exciting, and it also makes me have some empathy for them and how they might feel, especially some less confident writers. So the backyard is isolated, hidden deep within a nest of crawling tendrils of ivy and towering trees. Um, at the center, <coughs> perched on the branches of a wide, um, what's the type of tree? Oak. Oak is the treehouse. 
today. This dream is supposed to be two? Okay. Uh, Microsoft Word tells me it's supposed to be two different words. <laughs> It could be wrong, <laughs> yes, that's right. I should not trust Microsoft Word. This could be a opening for propaganda of some kind of like really catchy. <laughs> Enchanted, rickety, spider inhabited. So how can, so we can start weaving this in with some sort of transition, or maybe we can um, keep going with this paragraph. Uh, let's see. The beams supporting the walls are rickety. And Infested with spiders. Who? What is what is characteristic of these spiders? Are they frightening? Are they kind-looking, hostile? Creepy. Creepy. Infested with creepy spiders that pop out at mm, in moments. Uh, in moments you think they're gone. Okay, that's a little bit awkwardly phrased. But we can always go back and revise. Two open windows beckon adventurous climbers. So if you want to pop in through those windows. On the inside, the tree house is a garish yellow color. No offense to those of you who like yellow, by the way. <laughs> but on the outside, it's the brown color of the trunks of trees. And what else can we incorporate here? From a passing pedestrian's, actually you literally have a pedestrian in the middle of, an inch, in the middle of such a secret garden like that here. But, all right, from passing pedestrian's point of view, it looks ordinary. But from yours, it is enchanted. Okay, so there we go. We have this little description of the tree house. The backyard is in the backyard. The backyard is isolated, hidden deep within a nest of crawling tendrils of ivy and towering trees. At the center, perched on the branches of a wide oak, is the tree house. The beams supporting the walls are rickety, invested with creepy spiders that pop out in moments you think they're gone. Two open windows beckon adventurous climbers. On the inside, the tree house is a garish yellow color, but on the outside, it's the brown color of the trunks of trees. Perfect for camouflage. Is that how you spell that? No, that is not. I will trust Microsoft Word on this. Okay, you can see my weakness in the writer right there. From a passing pedestrian's point of view, it looks ordinary, but from yours, it is enchanted. So there we go. Now, I didn't manage to use all the words, but I can continue with this if I wanted to go into maybe some more um, advanced descriptive writing things, ask students, what do the spiders sound like? How could we use onomatopoeia if I really wanted to throw in fancy words? <laughs> um, overall, I think that an activity like this really gives students a chance to work together, but it also gives them a chance to see the teacher as a writer and someone who's not scared to put themselves out there and say, okay, we're going to really test the waters here and write ourselves. So that's my opinion of why writing collaborative with students is so awesome, and I love doing it all the time. Now another thing that I've heard mentioned a lot is this idea of creating a community of writers, or um, the way that I, I guess, thought of it was creating a community of editors as well. Because one thing that I've noticed in my own experience with writing is that often I'll write a first draft, an essay, and I'll submit it to the teacher, I might get a little bit of feedback, but then it's done with. I don't really do much with it, and it has a readership of one person. To me, that isn't as authentic as the writing that I do, say, for a blog or in a book. And I think that creating a community of writers is also creating a community of editors, allowing students to read other students' writing and give feedback. One way that you can do this really effectively is with something like a wiki or a Google Docs, and any of you use technology to try to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer feedback. Seeing a raised hand. Do you want to um, elaborate a little bit? Uh, I just scroll. You use, sorry? Awesome, great. So, to give an example, um, okay, so like a Google Doc. Probably, has everyone here seen Google Docs before? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. Um, probably most of you have, but let's say I'm a student, and I started writing, uh, let's say I uploaded my Treehouse Descriptive Passage. Ah. Okay, Treehouse Descriptive Passage, and I copied this, and my list of words here. 
Now what I could do is I could share it and ask my teacher, I could ask other people in my class to read it, and they could add comments. I could allow them to edit, or I could allow them to comment, or just to view. Now this is a really simple thing as you can see. It's literally two clicks and you're done. But the great thing about this is that suddenly you can get all these different points of views added on one document. And if a teacher, say, chooses to edit it, then the student can watch them doing it in real time and really learn the very, uh, essentially about the writing process. Now another great example, especially for discussing, I think, a book or um, any other big projects for students would be something like a wiki. So this is a wiki space that I used for the conference I organized, TEDx Redmond, but I think it could be used really effectively to um, work on a project because you can create all these different pages, people can edit it, and it really allows you to see, okay, who's been writing, who's been editing, and describe the changes. So again, showing that writing process and getting students to practice their typing skills, to practice their computer literacy skills, I feel like it's a lot of things in one. So the wikis and Google Docs are a really essential part of the 21st century writer's toolbox. Now I also want to ask a question, have any of you used social networking in your writing classes? I've seen some raised hands, awesome. Would you like to tell us more about that? I use social networking, I do not use it in writing classes. Sorry, I wasn't listening to this whole question. Oh yeah, no how do you use social networking otherwise? Um, we have a team of um, coaches in our district and we collaborate a lot together, both socially and professionally. What are you doing for this? How did you solve that problem? And so we put things up, um, share them on a blog or share them on a um, Facebook page so that we can all see what other people are doing or managing or happy birthday or whatever that um, connection is to be. That's awesome. Using it in a professional context. I think the important thing to realize for that is that you use social networking a lot as adults. If you're trying to create a really authentic community of writers, allowing students to tap into a not quite a professional network, but an educational network, allowing them to see here's how I make these connections, here's how I can bounce off ideas can be really powerful. And I think that a lot of times when you hear Facebook or you hear social networking and students, there are sort of alarm bells that go off and Oh no, that seems like a really bad idea, but in my own experience, I've been on Facebook for a little while, and um, I'm going to maybe take a bit of a risk here and bring you to my Facebook page, uh, so if there's any objection to content in my newsfeed, it is not my fault. Um, let me bring you to a definitely not objectionable content page. My art history um, class actually has a Facebook group, and this is really common in a lot of high schools. Students will set up these groups, especially if they want to complain about what's going on in class, or they just want to help each other out, post homework, what's been going on for people who are absent. It's been really nifty, and um, it helps a lot because all these questions that otherwise you might be confused by, or you might have to call up a teacher or something, are suddenly answered right here. Is another example. <laughs> The, I was doing Relay for Life in the American Cancer Society, and Facebook was like the key organizing tool. So you see how we're not just using Facebook to spread objectionable content. We're using Facebook to connect with our classes. We're using Facebook to promote the causes we believe in, to organize events, and to all in all really, I think, be better citizens in some ways. Obviously, that's not all that we're doing, but I think it is important to realize that this is a key component of most of my peers' uh, social networking experience. So, this might be more appropriate for, say, a high school audience, but let's say that, what is a book you read a lot in high school? Okay, so the great answer. 1984. Okay, so let's say we have 1984. And you could make it a secret group if you were extremely concerned about privacy. Now, this is something, obviously, you want to make sure that everyone in your class is on Facebook already. If you have people who aren't on Facebook, then maybe like telling them, hey, get on Facebook just for this might not be advisable, but in my experience, pretty much every one of my high school is on Facebook. So if you made a secret group, and then you add friends, so let's say I'll add my mom as an example, just so that I can start this group. Create, and choose an icon, okay. And now suddenly, I can post things, I can add photos or videos, I can ask questions, this is really cool, because it allows a lot of students who might not speak up otherwise to really participate, and so maybe I can pose a question. So, um, what is the question you could post about 1984? I've read it like half a year or so. Okay, question you could post about How is it relevant to, to today's society? That's a good one. Okay, how is, how is um, the message of 19 or how are the events of 1984 relevant to today's to events in today's? There we go, post. And then if you were a student, you could comment and say, as an example, 
Um, for instance, there's this news about England having over 1,000 surveillance cameras within Metro London or something like that. Or we could add something about surveillance or, you know, there's tons of different examples that could tie in. Now you can also do this if you're looking for a more secure environment and one that might be better for elementary school students, say, Edmodo is really awesome. I was recently, I recently had the opportunity to speak to a group of students in Maryland. And one of the really cool things about what they were doing was they were creating a big literary anthology of their work, which I was like, yay, this is a really wonderful, authentic example of how students can be writers and they're having this big project. But another cool thing was that I had these four video conferences with them, and I had never met any of them in person, but we had this connection through Edmodo so that when they have questions I can answer, they would often ask really interesting questions about, have you ever had this feeling where you had to give up? Or, you got really bored of something you're writing. I'm like, yes, you know, I'm a writer, but I get these feelings all the time. And so you're a writer, even though you might get blocked, uh, you might have um, writer's blocks sometimes. That's totally normal. And I think that it was really awesome to be able to connect with them. And it taught me a lot because I saw what is the process going through their mind, how do they feel, what are the things that make them insecure when they're about to share writing with the audience. So this was a really great example of a social network, Edmodo, an educational one being used for writing and for students to build this community. What I really loved was that it wasn't necessarily just me answering the questions all the time. A lot of times when I would say busy and I would have an answer maybe for a day or two, then other students would chime in and they would help each other out. And I thought, well, this is really awesome. What if more classes could have something like this where students could work together, say, here's an idea I'm thinking about. How can I make it more realistic? Or what do you think this character could say to make their dialogue sound more like a friend of yours or you know, more realistic, um, what is a descriptive word I could use? There's a lot of, there are a lot of possibilities for students when they have this community, a place to go to, and it also extends their experience with writing outside of the school day. Because a lot of times I'll hear people say, oh, you know, I do this writing in class, but it really doesn't have relevance outside of class. Or I, after I leave class, I stop writing. And that's something that we should probably try to prevent because when it comes down to it, writing is a lifelong thing, not just something that you want to do for an hour every day. So that's an example of social networking, Edmodo, Facebook group. You can ask questions, upload files and links. For instance, if I had this chair's passage, I could bring it to my Edmodo group and say, hey, here's my passage, can you please add comments and tell me what you think. So this would be a really awesome way to create that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, and it's all teacher monitored, so it's really cool. Now those are just a few of my ideas. Do you have any ideas for how you might use various online tools or social networking in your writing classrooms? Yes. Um, voice thread. Voice thread? Great. Okay, so how, how many people here are familiar with voice thread? Seeing some raised hands? Great. This is a really nice one because if you think about how a person's voice, um, I, I'm only, a, um, I'm not super familiar with it, but a little bit. Uh, if you think about how important someone's voice is, like when you're giving feedback, or really anything, or to tell a story, that can be really awesome as well. Great voice thread. Anything else? Any other ideas for online tools in writing classroom? Yes? What kind of apps are good on, for iPads? What kind of apps are good for iPads? That's a really good question. Um, for iPads, I would say, um, if students really like visual learning, um, I use drawing pad a lot. I would draw something and then I would take that and try to do a descriptive activity. Um, it depends on what level are the students. Well, the second language is English, the first language is ASL, so I'm just... It's a bit of a complicated scenario. We'll video them signing and then ask them to put that into English written words. So we use the iPad for signing a story and then their homework is to go home and write about it. Uh, so I'm just wondering how the video and, and the writing can happen on the one iPad. I wonder if there's an app that can help with that or, or anything we can use. It's just a new idea that we're trying at our school. We haven't begun yet, but we're playing around with that. I just wanted to see what kind of apps were out there. That's great. I actually haven't been seeing the iPad as much. Um, I definitely know that there are a lot of great writing apps out there. Actually, um, let me see. Some of the um, any ideas? You know, taking iPad apps like Penultimate and Note Taker that are all annotated for PDFs can include video um, and embed that in along with the notes of the PDF. A lot of those. Actually. That's 
Okay, so some of the notes that we have. Great. Spring pad is one that I've seen teachers use um, with kids where she's conferring, and this is just along the lines of the videoing, where they'll video conferences with kids um, and then take notes about the student's reading performance at that time. You certainly could do it around writing. But when the teacher is tied up and can't, she'll have the student conference with the iPad, and then the teacher can later watch what the student did, and then they can confer about it the next day. So using that video to make sure the contact stays there, even though the teacher might have to confer with too many people. Great. All amazing ideas. Any yeah. other? Yes. Dragon diction is a good one from the reluctant writer that is afraid of um, the mechanics of writing because they can see in their ideas. It will record it for them and type it out, and then they can go back into the edit. Dragon fiction. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I've actually experimented with that a couple times. For some reason, it, I don't know, when I, when I say the word Rob Dignagin, which is one of my favorites, I never quite get slides and have to write. <laughs> Everything else it usually works pretty well. So there's actually one more technology I suppose I should talk about that was really influential for me. I was in school for many years when I was younger, and a big part of my writing was that we would set up these blogs, and so actually, I should go to my blog and show you kind of the archive, uh, let's see, 2005, when I first started writing. So our teacher, Felisa, would give us these assignments where we would become an expert on various topics, and we got to choose what topic we wanted. So I chose ancient China, and I would write these nonfiction articles about all these really interesting things that I would find, and I felt like it made me a better writer because suddenly I was exploring nonfiction, which I had been really weary of before, but I was also exploring history, which was a really cool uh, connection there. So let me see if I can find one of those becoming an expert ones. Now another great thing is that people from around the world were starting to weigh in on my blog, which was pretty incredible for me because I was just like eight years old and I didn't think that anyone really cared what I, an eight-year-old in Redmond, Washington State, cared to say about ancient China or really much of anything. And uh, people were commenting. That was incredibly motivating for me as a writer. When I knew that people were tuning in or seeing what I had to say, I thought, how can I make my writing better? How do I make it more interesting for them? And sometimes people would actually give me comments. They would say, hey, you might want to go to this website and find better resources about China, or you know, this fact is maybe incorrect, actually, I kind of got that once or twice. Um, it made me more investigative, it made me evaluate websites better, it made me more careful of my grammar and spelling because I was suddenly thinking, okay, this is how people are evaluating me, so I need to make sure that I am respecting their time. So, let's see if I can find, sorry, my blog is kind of epic. I'm trying to find a, um, let's see, when did it become an expert was. Okay, well, here's a school assignment that I did. It's really tiny, I'm sorry. So we read Shine, Perishing Republic by Robinson Jeffers. Ow, oh, I've not read this in a while. This is from a really long time ago, 2007. And so this is something I wrote. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And now, for, to most of you, this might look like an average evaluation of a poem, something that your students would write. But for me, it really gave me meaning because I thought, okay, how do I make this interesting, not just for my teacher's eyes, not just something that will get an A, but something that people in Indonesia who saw me on TV will want to read, something that people in England who read about me in newspaper will be interested in reading if they like poetry and they like doing evaluations of poetry. So I think it definitely allowed me to consider that my writing wasn't just for one other person, the teacher. Uh, it wasn't even just for my classmates, that it was for the world. So when it comes to giving students the chance to be authentic writers, providing an authentic audience is key. How many of you allow your students to share their work or give regular opportunities for students to share their work with their class? Seeing a lot of raised hands, great. What about with the entire school? Okay, seeing so a few less. So if you're a little bit worried about, okay, putting students on a blog, I'm sure that there's district policy against that. Very well might be. You could make a blog that would be private to, say, um, students in your school. And I think that even making it larger than just a class can be really important. In the example of that class that I talked to in Maryland, they created this literary anthology, and it truly made my day to see that, because I saw how their work had developed how they had changed certain things. This is the same group that was on the Edmodo page, um, these lovely students at Vincent Farm. And just to show you a little example of what their writing looked like. So these were some fourth grade students. Let's see how this will load all right. So this was their anthology that they created.
literary magazine, and they printed this out. They distributed copies to their classmates and to other students in the school. They also included a lovely picture and some quotation marks. And this was really part of my day dedicated to Adore Sweet Talk for inspiration, cheerful guidance, which taught us all that we have it in us to be an author, which I thought was really amazing of them because also another one of the stories behind this video conference was that again and again technology issues had come up, things had gone wrong. In some ways, even though I evangelize using technology to such an extent, I may be the worst person for it because every single time uh, I, I did a video conference with these students, the video conferencing system had problems. And yet through all through all this adversity, we kept on persisting, we kept on creating stories, and these are a few of the things that they wrote. So, this one reminds me a lot of my writing. This is Regina's Impressive Illustration of Fantasy. Lovely title there. So once upon a time, there lived a pegasus named Gazelle, and she was very lonely. She was so lonely that when she flew, she left no rainbow trail, unlike the beautiful rainbow trails of other pegasuses. Her home was an abandoned sanctuary, and she had no mom or dad to care for her. And I started reading these stories, and I was so impressed with the trips through their imaginations that I was able to take, because as a 14-year-old, probably a lot of you have had this experience. As you grow up, you think, okay, that's a stupid idea. I won't write about that. That's too crazy. That's too fantastical. And so to see this, to go back and really have that experience was really incredible for me. I think that they taught me a lot, um, perhaps more than I taught them even. So when I think about how this audience for them made a huge difference, when they knew that I would be reading it, when they knew that their fellow classmates would be reading it, and how it drove a lot of them who might not have otherwise thought, okay, I need to really cross every T and dot every I, to do so, I was incredibly impressed. And I think that this is really a testament to the power of an authentic audience and that bigger leadership. So to go back to the present. And what are some other ideas? So there's a literary magazine idea, there could be an Edmodo group. What are some other ways that you could give students that authentic audience? Teen Inc., great. So websites where teenagers can submit work. Okay, Teen Literary Magazine website. This is a really good one, especially for high school students. Another one is that you can, it does have advertisements, which I suppose is an unfortunate thing. At least they're for Chase Bank. Um, not for you. So, um, you can encourage students to submit to websites like Teen Inc. Another one is you can encourage students to submit to Cricket, Cicada, Stone Soup, all the magazines which accept student writing. I think that this brings to mind another important thing, which is when students ask, why am I doing this? The answer of, because this technique will be on the state test, or because you're going to use it 20 years from now, is often not satisfying enough for, even, I love writing, I want to know why I'm writing this essay, or why I'm writing this poem sometimes. So, to give students an idea that what they're writing will go somewhere, it could go to the magazine, it could go to their classmates, is an incredibly motivating factor. Um, I, I would also say that, I know that you're not supposed to like get politics or argument maybe as much in the classroom, but ask the students to write to your elected officials about a thing that you really, really care about, um, or writing a, a letter, say, if you could write to President Obama, or perhaps taking a side in an argument. You know, those are things that got me writing quite a lot when I was younger, maybe because I was a bit more politically oriented. So, writing this blog and having the comments also really put me in touch with a lot of writers around the world, which I think is an incredible thing, to really give students the chance to see I can be of equal level with J.K. Rowling or with any of these other writers and really aspire to be like them. Um, that's really empowering. So allowing students opportunities to have their work published is something I would really advocate. So if we go back over um, wikis and Google Docs, VoiceThread, and Moto, Facebook, I think that there's one common thread, which is that they all build a network. They all build a community. And I think that showing students that writing isn't something that really happens within a bubble. You're not just, you know, solitary writer with your one idea, that it can really be a community effort, a collaborative effort, doing this by modeling it, and collaborating with students, the whole poison tester effect of writing stories together can truly be incredibly effective. So I would love to hear some more success stories from all of you. What are some things that have worked? What are some books that your students have really loved to read? So, books your students have really loved to read. Hunger Games. Hunger Games, yes, one of my favorites. Awesome. 
Which one? Divergent and insurgent. Divergent, okay. And any others? Westlandia. Westlandia? Oh, I've heard about that. I haven't read it though. Any others? The Lightning Thief series. The Lightning Thief series? Great. Now, what was. Is there anything in common kind of with all these books aside from really compelling storylines and maybe young characters? I guess they're relatable. Series? Okay. Now, how many of you allow students to have some say in the books that are being read in a given semester? Seeing some raised hands? Great. So, how do students work out which ones to decide? Is it a vote or do they nominate certain books? brings to mind a really another interesting idea. So let's say you take a book that's really popular, like the popular, like The Hunger Games, and you ask the students, how would you create a fan page for this book? And you can invite some of your fellow students to, and you can talk about why do you like this book so much? How might you convince someone who's like, oh, I won't read The Hunger Games, it sounds so violent and nasty. How would you convince them to read it that has a really good story? What are some common things that you like about the book? Really getting students to elaborate beyond, I love this book so much, can be difficult, I've seen, um, but asking them to start a fan page or write an editorial, write a book review, not, not a book report, I think that uh, could be super influential. What else? What are some other ideas that you have? Is it okay if it's only at a second grade level? Yes, of course. Um, I uh, participated in a writing class with some of the people in this room, and we did the important book, which is a book that is the important thing about a spoon is that it's hollow. You eat with it, it's something, it's something. But the important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. And so I read that aloud to kids, and we talked about what the author was doing, and we looked at the sentence structure. And for second graders, they had no problem recreating their own important thing. And the ideas that they come up with are amazing, even if it is. The important thing about a feather is that it's light. You can blow it and it will fly across the room, but the important thing about a feather is that it's light. I mean, that's a one-liner, that's all that student had to come up with, but now they have a poem that they feel amazingly successful for, and so we published that in an anthology of sorts and shared it back with those kids. And I did the same activity in fifth grade, and I got better writing from the second graders. Wow. Wow. That's really powerful. I think that it goes to show something as well about how students can be really self-limiting sometimes. Um, we can definitely be our own worst enemies. Maybe if you saw me sort of writing with the treehouse ideas, there are probably a thousand other places I could have taken it, but I was thinking, okay, what will work best, you know? And sometimes it's that um, amount of perfectionism or that thinking, what will other people think of me that can narrow that writing so it doesn't have that same, I guess, beauty of the second graders. What are some ways that we can help preserve that creativity? Well, one thing I think we need to do is not to tell kids, well, you can't write that. Right. Okay. Well, let me correct your spelling, let me pull out my red pen, you've got to have a period here, you've got to have a capital right. here, um, you need to go back and look that up. Let that stuff go for a long time and get the ideas out there so that anything goes, anything flies, and then you pick one thing out of your exploration and you're playing around, and I'm a fantastic speller like yourself, and um, <laughs> I love the fact that there's a computer so that nobody knows that I still can't spell the word benefit. To save my life, there's an E in the middle, I think. Or sometimes there's an I, it depends. Um, and I think letting kids just write for the sake of telling the story instead of writing for the sake of spelling things correctly. Because spelling does not know. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. This is my mom, by the way. <laughs> Hi. I can absolutely agree with you here. Um, that's how we helped Adora. And uh, we never told her anything about you can't do. It's always about just get your ideas. And uh, uh, I used to tell Adora, actually, you should tell a story about the tall tale stories that we'll always ask the kids to tell us in the car ride. And uh, that's how she got into telling stories. And, uh, and there's no story is too bizarre or too strange or not correct. 
and also agree with you about you know overcorrecting kids at early age. The most important thing is the love for writing, love to share ideas, and everything else can be fixed very easily. And later, Thank you. yes. Right. Yes. Definitely. No, I experienced one of that. I um, was teaching this class, I think it was in New York State a while ago, and I found myself getting a little bit really terrified of the ideas they were coming up with. Long story short, we were writing a poem about a ninja attacking a dragon, and the ninja had issues with bladder control when frightened. That was <laughs> now, I was thinking, oh my goodness, what will the teacher think? Will I be forever banned from speaking in the school again? Or the, Students want to go home and tell their parents about this, and they'll be shocked at how vulgar and terrible this is. But I, just then, I then thought, well, you know what? The fact that these fifth graders actually are comfortable enough with speaking about this issue and not like dissolving in the giggles every single time for a while, even. But um, the fact that they also see that poetry can literally be about anything that you want it to be, that it's not just the domain of dead old men from the 15th century, you know, that was the most powerful thing I think that we drew from that day. And I think that as a, as a writer and a teacher, I felt like I have to take myself less seriously sometimes because in all of, I've been reading so many classes and I feel like I have to be exactly like Charles Dickens or something. And that's like the worst way to start writing, I think, um, trying to put yourself into that mold. So really good point. I think that emphasizing the content, the idea, as opposed to the form in which the structure can be incredibly important. What are some other ways we can preserve creativity? As a staff um, at Inglewood Elementary, we've been working this year a lot on inquiry writing and allowing students to look at a genre of books, of, of, of texts, and figuring out their own understanding through the lens of an author. And what, what does nonfiction writing look like? And having the students come up with what nonfiction is, and then using their ideas, their inquiry that we engaged in as a class collaboratively, to then drive the writing instruction Great. So giving them that ownership piece um, and that tie-in to, to what they're doing. Giving students ownership? Great. Now, how many of you would say that all of your students call themselves writers? All of your students call themselves writers? A few people. Okay, so that's a really major part, I think. Making sure that every single student uh, feels that they're a writer and is a writer. It doesn't have to, you know, you can emphasize being a writer doesn't mean that you have this, like, insane personality or that you write every single minute, but it just means really being invested in your writing, caring about writing. And I think that that's one issue is that a lot of times students feel like writing is something I do, but it's not something I am, it's not part of my identity. So really giving students that ownership can be a major component of that. What are some other ideas? Because really I feel like reciprocal learning is such a big part of it. I, one of the reasons I was super excited about coming to a writing conference like this, or writing a teaching conference like this, was to be in a room with people like you and to be able to hear your ideas. So please do speak up. I, I work with students that are um, struggling writers, and they're in middle school, and I had them do a project where they created their own country, and they needed to draw it. So that helped a lot of students because that's where their talent comes. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to write some paragraphs describing it around. That's awesome. That, that actually brings to mind, um, when I was also younger, we had this activity, the Imaginary Country one. Um, I came up with one uh, called Denano. I'm not sure where that name came from, but we actually turned our entire classroom into this imaginary nation, and our teacher was the dictator because we decided that it was an oppressive regime that we'd have to overthrow. We were like really zealous seven and nine year olds. Um, and then we actually did overthrow her when she left the room. We walked her out and then declared our independence by writing the manifesto. Now, this was all completely unplanned, and I think that she might have been pretty mad at us while she was locked out, but when we showed her our manifesto of independence, um, she, I didn't realize what a cool thing we had done, and that is the type of thing, that is the type of writing that I think students can produce when, you know, there's, there are those organic moments, obviously I'm not saying all of you should um, suddenly give your students the opportunity to overthrow you, but it made us really think about hierarchy, made us think about government, and, you know, most seven-year-olds probably generally don't put overthrowing an oppressive regime on the top of their priority list for the day, but that was ours, and it made us produce some pretty awesome writing. So creating your own country, really encouraging students to tap into their visual learning by creating drawings, that's what we did as well. We made some really awesome flags and lots of propaganda materials 
it was really fun. Um, so maybe around the country, what are some other ideas, other projects? Yes. Well, I think that a lot of the, the ideas that we've heard are student behaviors, but I also think it's really important for teachers to lighten up a little bit yeah. mm -hmm. and be more accepting of maybe those out-of-the-box ideas that students have and not be quite so judgmental. Right, like not being judgmental. I think mean, that was the moment that I had. Like, I had to restrain myself from saying, no, we can't write about this ninja, and that was the idea. And I feel like letting it go and really understanding the value of it was a cool moment for me. So teachers should lighten up. What else? Yes? I'm kind of going along with that. Um, I teach third grade, and where we teach, like, the kids don't always have a lot of life experiences. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when they get stuck in, like, um, personal narratives, they're like, well, it has to be about some magical trip or some really cool event in their life. And you can write about just going to the park or going to Fred Meyers. And um, we read Tales of the Fourth Grade Nothing. I think that was a really good example of just how he writes about his life and his little brother. And so just to show them that you can write a story about just getting up in the morning and it can be a good story that can still have value. Right, making the magic out of mundane can be an incredible skill. As, actually, as a great example of that, since I, um, I taught a group of students about personal narrative one time, and I asked, so, oh, would you travel anywhere? Have you taken a nice trip? And a lot of them hadn't gone out of, this, out of the state, and a few hadn't actually really gone that much further than their town. So I thought, okay, how do we take a common experience that seems really boring? And one of the examples was choosing between flavors of ice cream. And so choosing between flavors of ice cream is generally not a life or death decision, <laughs> unless you're in some really weird ice cream parlor. And I asked students, okay, what, in the few seconds that you're staring at the two flavors of ice cream, what is going to your head? What are the feelings? And students came up with this list of words. It included things like, I think there was even like stressed out, and um, pulse was, like fast pulls, something else. Actually, why don't we try this here? What are some other words? What would come into your mind? How do you feel as you're looking eagerly between two different types of ice cream? Mouth-watering. Mouth-watering. Gray? Hungry. Hungry. Anxious. Anxious. Brain-sized points. Brain-sized points. Oh, sorry. Too many points means it's high in Weight Watcher points. Too many points. <laughs> Too many calories. I actually, it's kind of frightening um, when uh, elementary school students can be scarily aware of that. Um, anything else? Anticipatory. And uh, anticipatory, maybe like regretful a tiny bit, or wistful because you want both. So how do students make this list of words? And then we write these uber dramatic piece where it's like, you know, I tell them it's okay to dramatize a little bit, even though it's personal care, you can make this really exciting. So let me scroll down a little bit. Yeah, I This is a really, this is really gross, so I'm about to say it. <laughs> I figured I need to let it go, right? And that was what came to mind. Reminiscent of summer days, what are some other good memories you would think of from strawberries? And family gatherings. There was that alluring tub of chocolate tub. What a funny <laughs> word to describe. Carton of chocolate? What, what is the word? Tub. Tub, okay, good. Tub of chocolate ice cream. How would you describe chocolate? Decadent. Decadent. <laughs> okay, so 
So now you can ask the students, maybe they can even think of both. Which, which flavor should you choose? How do we make this more exciting? How do we up the ante? So maybe there's, you, it's like you have one second. How do you feel now? So really getting students to feel the suspense and to realize that this is a really mundane activity. You know, choosing between two flavors of ice cream, who feels like that? But the thing is that everyone can feel like that in that you know, split second, two seconds or whatever. You can have that little racing pulse and the looking back and forth and kind of weighing your options. So. dramatic expression of a sailor on a sinking ship <laughs> grasping a lifeboat. Wait, grasping a life jacket. I don't know why I thought it would just be like that. Maybe. You could ask someone to come up with a better simile. I'm sure they would have lots and lots of ideas. Um, <coughs> chocolate, I declared breathlessly, confident choice. But before we left the store, I did look back wistfully once <laughs> at that beautiful tub of strawberry. Okay, we're strawberry ice cream, I can say. So, we wrote that in like, what, two minutes, three minutes, however long that took. My eyes darted between the two flavors of ice cream, my pulse racing, strawberry, chocolate, strawberry, chocolate. Hurry up, my brother yelled. I wanted to yell back, but I had a decision to make. I was hungry, my mouth watered, my tongue dripping with anticipation. On one hand, I was anticipating that cool, sweet, strawberry flavor reminiscent of summer days and family gatherings. But there was a young tub of chocolate ice cream, definite and comforting. Finally, I threw open the freezer door and grabbed the tub of chocolate with the dramatic expression of a sailor on a sinking ship grasping a life jacket. Chocolate, I declared breathlessly, confident in my choice. But before we left the store, I did look back at the once with that beautiful tub of strawberry ice cream. <laughs> so, mundane experience turning into something dramatic, turning into something that has all the, you know, melodramatic stuff of maybe not life and death, but you know, pretty close. That's actually a really cool challenge. Ask students, how do you make a decision between two flavors of ice cream as dramatic as someone who's in a life or death decision? You know, I feel like um, that's a super important component of writing, being able to turn the mundane into the magical. All right, so let's get one more idea for our list of best practices, because this is literally what I take from conferences and incorporate into my thinking, so let's have a look. I think even if the mentors have already published authors, so if they like a certain genre of writing, then show them some examples of people who have done it before. Great. Getting published authors and mentors? Wonderful. I know those things can be really excited about author visits. Um, when Christopher Paolini, he wrote Aragon, and, um, that whole inheritance trilogy, he visited a local library. Unfortunately, I missed him, which I was really wish about, but I know that so many people turned out to see him. And so writers can be like celebrities, especially right after you write someone's work. All right, so we have this list, letting errors go, emphasizing the ideas instead of the form, telling a story for the sake of telling a story, telling tall tales to promote that imagination, making sure that creativity doesn't diminish as we get older, inquiry writing, looking at a genre of books, figuring out interpretation in the lens of an author, really giving students ownership. Making every single student feel like they are a writer and allowing them membership into a writing network with their students, with their uh, fellow students, with their peers. Creating um, someone's uh, their own country, drawing, writing, descriptive paragraphs, making a flag, you know, going through all the motions of being a country, maybe even writing a declaration of independence. Teachers should lighten up and be more accepting of out of the box ideas, emphasizing that you can write a story about those seemingly mundane experiences and getting published authors to be mentors in your classroom with students who are really big fans. Great, so we have this list, we have some of our tools to use, whether it's something as simple as Facebook, or you can set up an Enmodo, or a Wiki. All of these things are free, so that's really the great thing. And all of them have privacy controls, even with something like Blogger, you can set it up to be specific to just these people with just these email addresses. Um, and I think that this is really one of the cool things, is that I, as a writer, I feel like I would not be standing here today, I wouldn't have the opportunity to publish my books or really take my writing much further if I hadn't, from an early age, had many of the things that we discussed about. This authentic network and the chance to see writers as mentors, the chance to really hear from my peers about my writing. 
So you never know if the students walking in your classes might be able to really reach new heights. And I'm sure that you all know that every day. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Adora, how, um, how often do you find, as you think about yourself as a writer, looking at those examples, like not just meeting with an author, but looking at examples of what they've written, and how does that help you to make decisions about what you write? That's a really good question. Looking at examples of what other authors have written has really shaped my writing a lot, I would say, um, especially as I was growing up, because I was such a huge fan of like J.K. Rowling's books, and also C.S. Lewis, I would write very, I write about lots of wizards and witches and um, castles. I would go for this very sort of medieval historical setting actually quite a lot. Um, I think that a lot of the early influence was reflected in my writing, but more specifically as a student, seeing those examples of writers and what they've written was, I think, incredibly motivating. Another thing is, this is a really strange one, but seeing examples of really famous writers and having the opportunity to say, I really don't like this was motivating. We looked at a poem by, I think it was William Carlos Williams, or no, it was um, Wallace Stevens. Um, actually, maybe I can find it. And this is an example of, an, usually we treat, we treat poets and we treat writers like they're kind of sacred almost, like you don't say bad things about this classic because it is a classic. But we were really given this opportunity and Wallace Stevens wrote this poem, uh, it had, well, let's see, it might have been this one. Oh, here we go. This is The Houses Are Haunted by White Nightgowns. None are green, or purple with green rings, or green with yellow rings, or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange, with socks of lace and beaded centers. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here and there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in the right weather. So we read this all at Stephen's home, and my sister and I, we were at like seven and nine, we were like, what? Is this a poem? Really? Seriously? This guy is famous? And we were just completely aghast because we were like, we would never write anything like this. But then, of course, our, our um, project was to write a poem in the style of Wallace Stevens. So I wrote something about, um, I think it was rabbits dancing around and they are not wearing dignity nor damask type of fabric. Um, nor calico. They are also not wearing cotton or cotton blend with wool or something because I was just like so annoyed with this or this with that or the point being that being able, okay, so that was a sort of long-winded answer to your question about seeing examples, but when we saw an example of something, we were able to take issue with it, to point out things that we didn't like it, that we were confused by, taking away that kind of, I guess, sacred nature of this famous poet and everything, um, really debate it, and write in style so that we could better understand maybe how it might be even tough to write a poem like that, which might come across as easy. It gave me the chance to really feel like a writer, have ownership over that, and I think um, maybe form a more of a unique style, even if you're copying others. So, yeah, it's a great experience. Thank you. Any other questions? Wonderful. Um, you know, Dora's been on many, many TV <laughs> interviews and she speaks very passionately about what she believes in and literacy and teaching children. And we're thrilled to have her speak again this morning. Welcome, Dora. Thank you. 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 Thank you.